coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, so a note to our internet audience watching at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's titles, uh, we just call the number on your screen. We can take care of that for you. We will get the books signed and we can ship them to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Also a note to you Books and Books fans out there, we have a new location in the Carnival Tower of the Adrienne Arsht Center for the Performing Arts downtown. We have a beautiful new restaurant and bookstore there, so please check out Books and Books at the Arsht. This evening, Books and Books, in collaboration with the Center for Literature and Writing at Miami-Dade College, is very happy to welcome Mr. David Murrah, presenting the Big Read keynote discussing Japanese-American internment during World War II, featuring his two books, Turning Japanese, Memoirs of a Sansei, and Where the Body Meets Memory, An Odyssey of Race, Sexuality, and Identity. David Murrah is a writer, memoirist, poet, and performance artist who brings a unique perspective to our multiracial and multicultural society. Mr. Murrah is a sansei, a third generation Japanese American. In Turning Japanese, Mr. Mura chronicles a year in Japan in which his sense of identity as a Japanese American was transformed. And in Where the Body Meets Memory, he focuses on his experience growing up Japanese American in a country which interned both his parents during World War II simply because of their race. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. David Mura. I want to thank all those who are responsible for having me here. Paula fernandez Rannan in the Center for Writing and Literature at Miami-Dade College, the 2015 Big Read Program, Books and Books. Uh, I first met Paula when she worked at Anchor Books, which published both my memoirs and my book of poetry, so it's nice to reconnect with her again. So I, I'm going to open with some poems, then I'm going to talk about a little bit about Juliotska's uh, When the Emperor Was Divine, um, and try to provide some of the uh, historical, political context for that uh, book and for the internment. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own family and my own family's experience with the internment and also after the war, and my own journey to learn about the internment camps and to begin to speak about my own identity. Uh, and, and, and then at, at the end, I, I want to try to place the internment camps within a, a sort of broader context in terms of the issues of race in American society. So that's it's a lot. I'm, I'm going to try to get through it very quickly. But I'm going to start off with a poem, which I always do. And, and this is grandfather and grandmother in love. Um, and it's just about picturing my grandparents in bed together. Which you can sort of do with your grandparents, you really can't do with your parents. Um, and my, my grandfather wrote haiku, um, the Japanese form of, of uh, po poetry. He, was, he owned a greenhouse. Um, and there's one Japanese word, the two Japanese words in here, otosan akasan, which are father and mother, and Ran is chaos. Grandfather and grandmother in love. Now I, will take, now I will ask for the one true word beyond betrayal. The creaks and buoys like the bed strings used by the bodies that begot the bodies that begot me. Now I will think of the moon blowing the white sheets soaked in sweat that heard him whisper haiku of clover, azalea, the cry of the cuckoo, complaints of moles and beetles, blight and bad debts as the Biwa spirit bubbled up between them, its song quavering. Now I take this word, crack it like a seed between the teeth, spit it out in the world to root in the loam of his greenhouse roses, let it leave the sweet taste of teriyaki, a grain of her rice lodged in my molars, in my nostrils, a faint hot breath of sake. 
Now is a Tosan no Okasan drift towards each other. The reverberates the run of lovers, and the ship of the past bursts into that other world. And she, still teasing, pushes him away, swats his hand, a pesky tickling fly, and turns to his face, the cries out laughing. As he hauls her in, trawling the currents, gathering a sea that seems endless, depths a boy dreams of, where flounder, dolphin, fluorescent fins, fish with wings, spill before him glittering scales, and letting slip the net, he dives under. The night washes over them, slipping from sight, just the soft shush of waves, drifting ground swells, echoing the knocking tide of morning. Um, one of the things I feel lucky about is I, I, I come from two generations of successful marriages. Um, my, my, my aunt talks about how my grandparents um, went after the war, um, and they were fairly old. She went with them to uh, the movies and saw them holding hands, and she, she had just been married, and, and she was going like, why, am I, why aren't I and my honey holding hands and my parents are holding hands? So Julioska has this book, The Buddha in the Attic, which is about the first generation uh, women in uh, Japanese Americans. And the way Japanese Americans count the generation is the first generation is Issei. And they mainly came, especially to the mainland, between 1890 and 1924. And the reason why it cuts off in 1924 was the Asian Exclusion Act, which forbid uh, immigration from Asia. Um, and while some other countries let uh, I immigrants leave their countries, the Japanese uh, government stopped, uh, because of that act, stopped immigration to America. So there's a very distinct end to the first generation. And then the second generation was mm -hmm. born um, from about 1910 to 1935, which is my parents' generation, and they were called Nisei. Uh, and this goes on a Japanese, Ichi, Ni, San, Yong, Go, one, two, three, four, five. So the second generation, the Nisei, were born, like I said, between 1930 and 1910 and 1930, 35. They were all uh, American citizens. <coughs> so it's the first two generations, mostly, that were interned during World War II. Um, and, and one of the things in Julioska's second novel she talks about is how there were picture brides, and people sent somebody else's picture oftentimes. So when the when women came off and they were looking, they calling out a name, they found that the picture didn't match. But as I say in this poem, my grandfather was so good, handsome, he came in person. He didn't use his picture. So this is a poem about him and it, it talks about the picture brides, it talks about his gambling, and it talks about how he returned to uh, Japan after my grandmother died. Relocation, the grandfather Uemura. People married by pictures then. When they lied, the bride stepped from the ship and found a dwarf, nose gnarled as a ginger root. He was so handsome. He came in person, held her as America rose and fell ahead. Gulls shrieked on the dock, the pale ghosts gathered. He bought a greenhouse on a field hand's wages and with Cuban cigar jammed in his jaw, watched his orchids like petulant courtesans. Nights, the eucalyptus swayed, his eyes gleamed with his packard's chrome beneath the moon. He slapped his thighs, rubbed the dirt from his hands, prayed for dice-clicking sevens. By dawn, he was whistling home. He stumbled in roses, said hello to the thorns. When they shipped him like cattle to the camps, he sat in the mess hall and creased a napkin like the nine ply folds of heaven. Out of his hands flew a slim white crane his wife shook her head, 
smiled, forgot barbed wire, guards. At a mule pulled plow, he wiped his baseball cap across his brow, looked past the wires to the prairie where the west begins. Tipping his cap to the corporal in the tower, he muttered, Baca, picked up the reins. He named his son, Katsuji, Prince of Birds. After the war, it was Tom, such a strange name, like someone beating a drum, hollow, a hard echo. He laughed at the boy's starving Jesus, nails piercing the little bones of the hands and feet, told him the Buddha always ate well. When she died, he returned to Tokyo. Still attached to his body, limbs folded on a chair, he spent his evening composing haiku. Bonsai tree, like me, you are useless and a little sad. In Julioska's novel, the um, father is rounded up uh, with other Japanese Americans right at the start of the war and kept from the family through the whole war. And many of these men, like the father in, in When the Emperor Was Divine, were kept even after the war. Um, so this is a poem, and, and they were kept sometimes because of, they were in prison sometimes because of their job. A lot of fishermen were rounded up. Uh, uh, Min Yasui, who uh, was one of the four Japanese Americans who took the case to the, of the internment camps at the Supreme Court, when the FBI came, they, they uh, held up a cup that he'd gotten from the Japanese government for being a good <laughs> businessman. And the other thing they, they held up was a map of the Panama Canal. And they said, this proves you're, try you're gonna blow up the Panama Canal. And he said, I didn't even draw that map. That map was drawn by, by my daughter for a school project. Oh and still they insisted, they said, you need to prove to us that you're not uh, planning to blow up the Panama Canal. And as Minyasui would say, he's like, how can you prove that you're not gonna do something that you're not gonna do? So uh, this man in this letter, he's writing to his wife in another camp who and this man I picture to be uh, owning a greenhouse like my grandfather. He mentions his friend Matsuo and Matsuo's bruise because the Japanese Americans sometimes fought amongst each other about how to deal with the camps, how to respond to the government. Um, and uh, Mats, Matsuo plays a um, uh, biwa, which is a Japanese stringed instrument. Letters from an internment camp. Dear Michiko, do songs sound different in prison? I think there are more spaces between the words. I think when the song ends, the silence does not stop singing. I think there is nothing but song. <coughs> Matsuo's back, his bruises almost heal, a tooth missing. His biwa comes out again with the stars, a nightly matter. He sends his regards. Do you get fed these putrid gray beans? I hope you haven't swallowed too many of them. They put my stomach in a permanent revolt, shouting no emperor should ever feed his people so harshly. I agree. That's you and I grow skinny together. Let's keep the peace. Any second the lights will go out. I look around and see many honest men who hide their beauty as best they can. I think that's what the whites hate. Our beauty, the way we carry the land and life of plants inside us, seedlings and fruit, flowers and a flush tree, fields freed of weeds. Why can't they see the doors inside them? So, 
if someone find an answer to that, they would find an answer to why those who are hungry go off to battle to become hungrier and colder, farther from home. Nine o'clock, the lights all out. Sometimes, Michiko, I think of my greenhouse. How I used to stand at night in its fressy, steaming dark and say, these are the most beautiful orchids and roses in the world. And their fragrance seeped inside me, stayed even when I sold them. What is it like now in Tokyo? They say it is sunk like a great ship. Forgive me. Breast with a chance to talk to my wife, more beautiful than any greenhouse rose, all I can do is moan. And yet, if I didn't tell you, I would blame you for not listening for what I haven't spoken. And it's too late for that. When you write back, please tell me what country I'm in. I feel so poor now. These words are all I own. Um, this, is, this poem is about a Nisei, a second generation, um, and uh, he's gotten out of the camp. It's 1945, and, and uh, he has to take a psychological test for a job. So this is about the psychological test. Internment camp psychology. Just after his release, Moss took a psychological test. Three questions he never forgot. Do you think people are out to get you? Do you feel you are being followed? When you see a crowd of strangers walking towards you, do you try to avoid them? To all three, he answered yes, and knew he sounded insane. Um, I wrote this this past week in my blog because it was uh, the anniversary of Roosevelt signing the order which sent the Japanese Americans to the internment camps. And it was also a reaction to Giuliani's comments about how Obama doesn't love America. <laughs> On this anniversary of President Roosevelt signing Executive Order 9066, which ordered the internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans, Thinking of Giuliani's remarks and how Obama does not love America, quote unquote, because, quote, he wasn't brought up the way you and I were brought up through love of this country, unquote. Thinking of the anti-Muslim and anti-Arab prejudice that has arisen in this country, thinking of the anti-immigrant pre prejudice, I recall this editorial from the Los Angeles Times in 1942. And this is a real editorial from the Los Angeles Times. A viper is a viper, nonetheless, a, a viper is nonetheless a viper wherever the egg is hatched. A leopard's spots are the same, and its disposition is the same whenever it is whelped. So a Japanese American born of Japanese parents, nurtured by Japanese traditions, living in a transplanted Japanese atmosphere, and thoroughly inoculated with Japanese thoughts, Japanese ideas, and Japanese ideals, notwithstanding his nominable brand of accidental citizenship, almost inevitably, and with the rarest of exceptions, grows up to be a Japanese, in a, to a Japanese in his thoughts, his ideas, and his ideals, and himself is a potential and menacing, if not an actual danger to our country, unless properly supervised, controlled, and as it were, hamstrung. So, 
this was actually better than some of the things that were in the Hearst papers. Okay. So, so many thoughts. Did the LA Times write the same thing about Italian Americans against Giuliani's parents? And that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. If Giuliani and the LA Times were right in their illogic, how is it that the 442nd, the division of Japanese Americans, was one of the most decorated units in Europe in World War II? US generals actually fought with each other to have the 442nd under their command which is not to slight the no-no boys who protested the internment and the taking away of their constitutional rights by resisting the draft and who showed their patriotism by upholding the Constitution in ways neither the Congress nor the President did. And my novel is actually about uh, one of the, no uh, uh, the fa a no-no boy and his son and, and their family after the war. It's called Famous Suicides of the Japanese Empire. The racism thrown at Obama is just a slightly more disguised version of what was thrown at the Japanese American community over 60 years ago. The other thing I wrote in my blog is remember how there was all the protest about the building of mosques in Manhattan and Tennessee? And also thinking about all the rhetoric against immigrants? Well, here's a poster that was posted in Hollywood in 1922. Japs. You came to care for lawns. We stood for it. You came to work in truck gardens. We stood for it. You sent your children to our public schools. We stood for it. You moved a few families in our midst. We stood for it. You proposed to build a church in our neighborhood, but we didn't and we won't stand for it. You impose more on us each day until you have gone your limit. We don't want you with us, so get busy, Japs, and get out of Hollywood. And you can see sentiment like that, obviously, today. So, history repeats itself. How much have we learned? How much do we need to learn? In an interview, Julie Oetzke says about um, her book in the background, she says, and, and the contemporary relevance. I'm still surprised that there has not been more of an outcry against the Bush administration's recent assault on civil liberties, the secret arrest and indefinite detention of more than 1,200 Middle Eastern men, which by now is larger, the suspension of habeas corpus and the right to trial by jury, the electronic monitoring of lawyer crime conversations, the use of military tribunals. It is actually possible today for a long-term U.S. resident suspected of terrorist activity to be arrested and sentenced to death in a secret military trial based on hearsay evidence. One does have to wonder, is this America? Well, yes it is. It's an America not so unlike the America in which my grandfather was arrested on December 8, 1941. Um, when the Emperor Was Divine is, is which people are reading and which you all, by coming here, get a, is it right, a free book? Sure. Yes. Yeah, which is a great, a great program. I, I love that. Um, Julioska provides a lyrical, incisive, and moving portrait of the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during the World War II in what have been called relocation centers, internment camps, or concentration camps. The family lives in Berkeley when the war breaks out, and the father, like certain members of the Japanese-American community at the time, mostly the leaders, was imprisoned right after the war. The novel starts with the preparations of the mother and two children, a girl of ten, a boy of seven, as they respond to the notices that all Japanese-Americans, citizens and non-citizens, should report to assembly centers by a certain date, a few months into 1942. The novel mainly follows the experience and consciousness of the mother, daughter, and son through their imprisonment, their release, in the first few months after the war ends. The novel is written in a spare, almost poetic prose, and its emotional tone is restrained and quiet. None of the characters, interestingly, are actually named, and this emphasizes their status as elemental or primal figures. Father, mother, girl, boy. 
Otsuka has spoken of her influence uh, by Hemingway, she cites as a prime influence, and you can see the influence there. Um, it, it's very much a show-don't-tell aesthetic. Um, and I'm going to speak about uh, that aesthetic in relationship to my, mo my own in a bit. Um, she's also influenced by Marguerite de Ross, she says. And so there's inf uh, moments of brief sort of lyrical beauty and, and it, throughout the book in observations and things and you come away remembering certain moments. Clearly one of the moments you remember is the moment where the, the mother has to kill the family dog um, with, with a shovel. Um, and it's interesting because my aunt speaks about uh, the internment camps in, uh, to, to grade schoolers and she says the thing that really always gets the kids is she had to give up her dog. Um, so, it, and, and the other, the other novel that, that the, the, uh, the novel reminds me of, I don't know if you've, if you've read To the Lighthouse, and in the middle there's this long lyrical passage, which is a passage of time and passage of World War I, and, and uh, the sort of, and the death of the mother and the separation of the family. And the, uh, the sort of passage of time in, uh, when the Emperor was divine so reminds me about that. Um, and so the reader moves through the book pulled by a particular vision and consciousness of each of the main characters as they go through the fear and chaos of preparing for the internment, the train ride to the camps, the years of imprisonment without a sense of when or how their imprisonment might end, and the re readjustment into American life after the war. As one approaches the end of the novel, it's the absence of the father which looms largest. And his return is captured so poignantly and powerfully, and yet with a sense of masterly restraint and its tragic implications concerning the ways their imprisonment damaged so many Japanese American families. But particularly the men who were kept, these men who were kept from their families throughout the war, <coughs> most simply because of their position in the community, because of their jobs. So part of what I, what I want to do tonight is just set a little context. I've told you about Roosevelt's order to intern the Japanese Americans. Um, 120,000 Japanese Americans were living on the West Coast, and they were put in these uh, prison camps under, uh, with barbed wire fences, rifle towers, um, and armed guard. Um, the, and, and sometimes people, people remark that this was for the Japanese American safety. But as one, uh, as several camp members uh, pointed out, well then why were the machine guns pointed in at us? Um, one quarter were Issei, first generation, who were not allowed by law to become citizens. And were not actually al uh, by law allowed to have property. So the pro when, the, when they, they bought property in the names of their children, the second generation, my parents' generation. And there three, so three quarters of the uh, of people interned were American citizens. And the, most of them were under 25. Um, it should be pointed out, no Japanese American was ever convicted of espionage or activity against the American government. Um, and yet the government believed that the Japanese Americans were uh, a, a potential for fifth column activity and uh, um, sabotage against America. The, the Lieutenant General DeWitt, who headed the internment uh, arrangements and was head of the West Coast Defense, here's what he said. The Japanese race is an enemy race, and while many second and third generation Japanese born on United States soil, possessed of United States citizen, have become Americanized, the racial strains are undiluted. It is therefore follows that along the vital Pacific coast, over 112,000 potential enemies of Japanese extraction are at large today. There are indications that these are uh, organized and ready for concerted action at a favorable opportunity. The very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. 
So, so essentially, the fact that nobody has done anything is, is indication that actually we're in danger. And again, as I pointed out, no Japanese American was ever convicted of any sorts of activity. In the Senate, Senator Tim Stewart says this. They are cowardly and immoral. They are different from Americans in every conceivable way. And no Japanese should have the right to claim American citizenship. A Jap is a Jap anywhere you find him, and his taking the oath of allegiance to this country would not help, even if he should be permitted to do so. They do not believe in God and have no respect for an oath. It should be noted that although there were 11 million German Americans, the number of German Americans that were in turn were ma mainly German nationals, uh, 11,000, 1,800 Italian Americans were, were imprisoned. Uh, it should also be noted that, that in Hawaii, where there were 150,000 Japanese Americans, there were just a small portion of the population who were interned. And the reason for that was the whole Je the Hawaiian economy would have collapsed <laughs> if they would have taken out the Japanese population. Which also indicates, uh, I, I think, that, that the, the history of anti-Asian bigotry on the West Coast had a lot more to do with the reasons why Japanese Americans were interned. Also, desire for Japanese American property, because a lot of times, uh, especially in their truck farms, Japanese Americans took up land that nobody else was using and, and turned them into successful farms. Um, uh, finally, I, I just want to, and also <coughs> just one other historical fact. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed an apology to Japanese Americans, and in it he wrote that the real reasons for the internment were not military security, but racism, wartime hysteria, and a failure of leadership. Um, I just want to say one other thing about, about the novel, which are, is, is a a terrific novel, and I'm so glad that it, it, it's being read uh, in colleges and high schools throughout the country. Um, it, it is a terrific teaching tool. Um, at the same time, I, I, I want to say just that any one author can't give a picture of a whole community. Um, just like if you know just one member of a community, you can't know that community. If you know dozens of members of that community, suddenly the one person that you know becomes individualized in a way that, that isn't possible if you know just one member of the community. Moreover, if you know like dozens or a hundred members of the community, suddenly your, your own image of who that community is, you can sort of collectively understand something about the community as a whole and how each individual uh, is part of that community. And clearly, one of the things about the internment camps was that the American government or the military uh, authorities knew nothing about the Japanese American community. And the, they didn't really understand how firmly rooted the Japanese Americans were in America. And e e e even now, I mean, like one of the quarrels I have with Snow Falling in Cedars, is, is that, that novel and the movie, is they make the Japanese Americans they really emphasize, because they pick the husband of the, of the woman in, in, in the film is a Kibay, uh, and he was educated in Japan, which was a small portion of the Japanese American population of my parents' generation. He seems much more Japanese than my uncles, my parents, uh, um, who, who, you know, when I was growing up, did not seem Japanese at all. Uh, and, and in, in fact, you know, my, my father probably, I don't know if I should get into it, but my, my father is so hard. I mean, my, my father would probably agree with Giuliani that that's how, you know. Uh, um, anyway, uh, so, so now, so I, I'm going to talk about, you know, from my own work from now, uh, and um, I'm going to read to you first from uh, my memoir, Turning Japanese, and in 1985-86, which was actually during the height of the anti-Japanese uh, uh, feeling in this country when there were books that were written 
uh, one of them was uh, The Coming War of the Japan. Um, I don't know how that person who wrote that book still has tenure, but he still does. I mean, I can, uh, um, and, and so I went to Japan. And, but even then, when I, w I went, I was sort of reluctant to go to Japan. And uh, th so this is the introduction to who I am. I am a sansei, a third generation Japanese American. In 1985, through luck and through some skills as a poet, I traveled to Japan. My reasons for going were not very clear. At the time, I'd been working as an arts administrator in the Writers in the Schools program sending other writers to grade schools and high schools throughout Minnesota. It wasn't taxing, but it didn't provide the long stretches needed to plunge into my own writing. I'd applied for a U.S.-Japan Creative Artists Exchange Fellowship mainly because I wanted time to write. Japan? Well, that was where my grandparents came from. Didn't have much to do with my present life. But then Japan had never seen that important to me, even in childhood. On the holidays, when we get together with relatives, I didn't notice that the faces around me looked different than most of the faces at school. I didn't notice that my grandparents were absent. My grandfathers had returned to Japan after my grandmother's died. No one spoke about them, just as no one spoke about Japan. We were American. It was the 4th of July, Labor Day, Christmas. All I noticed was that the food we were eating, futomake, mazugohan, teriyaki, kamaboku, was different from what I liked best. <laughs> McDonald's, pizza, hot dogs, tuna fish salad. For me, Japan was cheap baseballs. This was before Japan was known for like Toy Toyotas and Lexus. Uh, cheap baseball, <coughs> you hit them and they fall apart. Godzilla and weird sci-fi movies like Starman where you could see the strings that pulled him above his enemies and let him fly in front of a backdrop so poorly made even I ate was conscious of their fakery. Then, there were the endless hordes storming GIs and war moves. Sometimes the Japanese hordes got mixed up in my mind with the Koreans, all tiny Asians with squinty eyes mowed down in row after row by the steady shots of John Wayne or Richard Widmark. Before the television, wearing my ever-present Cubs cap, perpetual yeah. losers, I crouched near the sofa, saw the enemy surrounding me. I shouted to my men, hurled a grenade, I fired my gun. And the Japanese soldiers fell before me one by one. Of course, by the 80s, I was aware, as everyone else was, of Japan's burgeoning power, its changing image. Toyota, Nissan, Sony, Toshiba, the eco economic, electronic, automotive miracle. Rather than savage barbarism, the Japanese were now characterized by a frightening efficiency, a tireless energy. Japan was a monster of industrialization, of huge world-hungry corporations, unfair trade practices, the trade imbalance, robot people. But none of that had much to do with me. After all, I was just a poet. So when I did win the fellowship, I felt I was going not as an ardent pilgrim longing to return to the land of his grandparents, but more like a contestant on a quiz show who wins himself a trip to Bali or the Bahamas. Of course, I was pleased with the stipend, the plane fare for me and my wife, the payments for Japanese lessons. But part of me wished the prize was Paris, not Tokyo. I would have preferred French bread and brie over sashimi and rice, Baudelaire and Proust over Basho and Kawabata, structuralism and Roland Barthes over Zen and D.T. Suzuki. At least I'd studied French in high school. And having grown up next door to Skokie, Illinois, the kids used to call it the land of perpetual spring, a rose in bloom on every corner. <laughs> I knew more Yiddish than Japanese. This contradiction, though, remained. Much of my life I'd insisted on my Americanness. Had shown most connections with Japan and felt 
proud I knew no Japanese. Yet I was going to Japan as a poet in my Japanese ancestry. Uh, it was there in my poems, my grandparents, the internment camps, the hibakusho, victims of the atomic bomb, a picnic of Nisei, second generation Japanese Americans. My uncle who'd fought with the 442nd in Europe. Two of the poems were written mainly in blank verse, rather than haiku, tanka, or haibu. But perhaps it's a bit disingenuous to say I had no longing to go to Japan. It was obvious my imagination had been traveling there for years, <coughs> unconsciously swimming the Pacific against the tide of my family's immigration and my parents' desire after the internment camps to forget the past. Um, when I was growing up, nobody in my family talked about the internment camps. Nobody sat down and said, you know, during, during the war, David, we were all rounded up in the West Coast, put in prison. You know, we weren't given a trial. We weren't given the writ of habeas corpus. We weren't able to face our accusers in, in, in court. None of us were ever convicted of any sort of espionage. Nor, nor did anybody say, you know, we got out and we sort of felt somehow ashamed of what happened. Nobody said that. What happened would happen is is a name would come up. The only way I heard about the camps at all when I was growing up was somebody would say a name, and then somebody would say uh, Nihonji no Hakuji. And Nihonji was Japanese. I didn't know that because nobody explained that to me. But Nihonji was Japanese, Hakuji was white person. It was Nihonji, and they go, What camp were they in? And somebody would say, like Manzar, Minidoka, Topaz. And then the conversation would go on. And I, I had a friend who, who said, I thought they were summer camps, <laughs> the way people talked about them, because no, nobody talked about it. <coughs> One of the ways I, 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 I talk about it is, is, is that if you're put in prison for shoplifting, when you get out, how do you show your reform? You don't shoplift anymore. So what happens if you're put in prison because of your race and ethnicity? If that is your crime, you try to erase any sort of evidence of your ethnicity, of your past. You don't talk about it. And as for your race, you can't erase that. But I knew very early on that I was supposed to identify with the white majority. There's a poem, which I don't have time to read, which, 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 where I, I pretend like I'm Paladin, who is this uh, gunslinger from the 50s in the 50s te television show. And my, my friend Rick Shiomi read the poem, and he said, do you remember what happens at the beginning of Paladin? And the show was Have Gun, Will Travel. And I said, yeah, I remember. Paladin comes down the, the stairs all dressed in black with two six guns looking really cool. And Rick said, no, no. At the beginning of the show, a Chinese messenger runs into the lobby going, <laughs> telegram, telegram for Mr. Paladin. <laughs> and even when Rick said that, I don't remember that Chinese message. So what was going on in my brain when I'm five or six, seven, watching this TV show? I know, like, I don't want to be the Chinese messenger. I don't, and whose name was Hey Boy. Okay, I don't want to be the figure of fun. I don't want to be served. I want to be the cool guy. I want to be a white guy. Like I said, I went to, I went to, uh, my parents, we moved out of a Japanese American building in Chicago. We moved to a Jewish suburbs. Um, and when, when I was in high school, a white friend would say to me, I think of you, David, just like a white person. I would go, yeah, that's what I want to be. That's, and I really was echoing because because when my father was in the camps, a te white teacher said to him, you'll get out of the camps, and you'll get back into America. But for your sake, try and not be just 100% American, but 200% American. And so 
I, I was exactly the same way. And when my wife first met me, I said, don't call me Japanese, don't call me Japanese American, don't call me Asian American. I'm not a person of color. You know, I, I, I just said, I'm an American, I'm an individual. Uh, and I, I didn't say, and I'm just like a white person. But that's really what I was telling her. In my late 20s, and it really took me that long, I read this passage from Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask. And Fanon was, uh, uh, he, he was part of the re uh, revolution in Algeria against the French. He was a psychologist. Uh, and he wrote a book called Black Skin, White Mask, which I recommend to anybody. Um, and he talked about the school child in, in the West Indies, the black school child in the French West Indies colonial situation and how that school child would read uh, history books and, and books about our ancestors, the Gauls, the French, and how the uh, great white European hunters went into Africa to civilize the savages. And Vanon asked, what is that black school child learning? And his answer was self-alienation, self-hatred, and an identification with their colonial oppressor. And I read that and I went, oh. <laughs> I'd swear now, but we're, I guess we're on, I don't, I don't know who this is going out to. But, but I, I did a little turn, and I was oh, that's what I've been doing. And after that, I started reading actually black writers. Because I found in black writers, and I was really, actually, I'd gone through five years of English graduate school, but I'd read no writers of color. Which means, actually, the professors my age, they could have gotten an English PhD without reading any writers of color. So I started reading black, and I suddenly found a language for talking about race that I went, oh, I didn't find this language with white writers. Suddenly I began, and, and then I also began thinking about, you know, there, there, there's a moment where, you know, it, it, it's a historical moment because, because my, my father was in Jerome, Arkansas. And they would get off on day-long passes. And so they got on a bus. And the bus is segregated. And the question is, where do you sit? And the, the Japanese-American author um, who wrote a history of the term uh, of Japanese-Americans, uh, this is the way that he describes it. He says, the evacuees were sent to Arkansas had been astonished to find that they're regarded as white by the whites and colored by the blacks. The whites insisted that the Japanese Americans sit in the front of the bus, drink from the white man's fountain, and use the white man's restroom, even though suspecting them of disloyalty to the nation. And the blacks embarrassed many in Issei when they urged, us colored folks got to stick together. If there was no middle ground in the South's racially polarized society of black and white, in the rest of the country after the war, Anise could live as a yellow-skinned American without upsetting too many people. And he also discovered it was not particularly difficult to be accepted into the white man's world. So, you know, that the world is defined as a white man's world. It's not a white women's world, obviously. And, and, and it's also, the, he pitches Anise is not really caring about it being accepted in the black world. And, um, it's, it's very interesting because only two years ago, my aunt told me this other story. And I, I, that, this will be the last thing I'll, I'll talk to you since we're coming up on time considerations. And I'll open it up to questions. So this was the experience of my grandmother and my aunt. They got out on a day-long pass. And they took a train to the next town because it was really cold and like the uh, <coughs> Uh, barracks in it. And when the emperor was divine, people were really cold, there was no heating, so they were going to try to buy blankets. So my grandmother, my aunt, who's like eight years old, they walk into this country store in Arkansas. And uh, at the corner, there's a clerk attending to a white couple. And at, at the other end of the counter is a black couple. So the clerk gets done uh, attending to the white couple and turns to my grandmother. And my grandmother points, they were here first. And the clerk says, they can't shop here. 
They can only shop on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They're just looking. And my grandmother, bless her heart, says to my aunt, let's get out of here. So they leave. They come to the train. Two cars. One a white, white car, black car. The white car is filled with white GIs. There's no room. So my grandmother and my aunt, they sit in the black car. The conductor comes, says to my, my grandmother, lady, you need to get in the front car. And, and, and my grandmother says, it's too crowded. No seats. The conductor says, you have to get in the front car. And my grandmother goes, I Japanese, I enemy. <laughs> And the conductor goes, lady, I don't care who you are, where you come from. If you don't get in the front car, this car is for the colors. If you don't get in the front car, I'm going to kick you off this train. So she got in the front car because she had to go. But what that story told me, and my dad has a certain amount of racism, I think, towards blacks. I realized he didn't learn his racism from his parents. My grandmother knew who she was. She knew she wasn't white. She knew why she was interned. She knew why she couldn't become a citizen. And she identified with the blacks. Sometimes when, she, when Asian Americans identify with white people, uh, 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 other um, people of color get angry. Because sometimes we choose to occupy the honorary white spot. <laughs> and what that means, when my father gets on that bus, that segregated bus in 1943, or my aunt and my, my grandmother get on that train, their identity is not simply like my Japanese cultural background or I'm a Japanese American, my relationship to white America. It's also to the matrix of black-white relations. And who am I going to identify with? And America gives a, a thing, you, you should identify with those in power. Because if you don't, you're even in further trouble. So one of the things that we have to look at, even something like with the internment camps, is to look at it in terms of all of history, American history, along <coughs> these issues of racial lines. Because one of the reasons why for instance, Asian Americans are, were, ended up in California is because California was a free state. And they needed cheap labor. And they needed labor who were not citizens and who could not own land. So it couldn't be Native Americans because they had a claim to the land. It couldn't be black Americans who were then citizens after uh, the Civil War because they could claim land. So uh, this is all just to give con complicated context to all of this. Um, I'll leave you with just a poem which is which I wrote when I was in Japan and um, it, was, it was my claiming of my Japanese background and well actually not in Japan after I returned from Japan it was when my <coughs> wife was pregnant and I would listen to my wife's belly all the time I so much wanted my daughter to uh, know me that I even put made recordings of my voice and put the headphones on my wife's belly. <laughs> so this imagines a Japanese ancestor doing what I was doing at the time, which was listening to my wife's belly. Listening. And from that village, steaming with mist, riddled with rain, for the fishermen in the bay hauling up nets of silver flecks, for the droning of the Buddhist priest in the morning, incense thickening in his voice a bit otherworldly, almost sickly. From the oysters ripped from the sea bottom by half-naked women, their skin darker than the bark in the woods, their lungs as endless as some cave where a demon dwells. Soon their harvest will be split open by a blade, moist, meaty flesh drenched in the smell of sea bracken, the tidal winds. From the torii halfway up the mountains, and the steps to the temple, but the gong shimmers with echoes of bright metallic sound. 
from the waterfall hovering in the eye and an illusion rising from the cedars that have nothing to do with time for the small mud cramped streets of rice shops and fishmongers from the pebbles on the riverbed the aquamarine stream floating pine trunks spelled upstream by men with hachimaki tied round their forehead and grunts of osho I remember from my father in childhood from this mythical land of the empty sign and the thousand thousand manners on the tip of this peninsula, far from Kyoto, the shogun's palace. In a house of shoji and clean-cut pine, crawling on to a straw dawn, one of my ancestors lay his head, as I do now, on a woman's belly, and felt an imperceptible bump, like the bow of a boat hitting the swell and wondered how anything so tiny could cause such rocky, unbroken joy. Thank you. Folks, we still have time for one or two questions if anyone has a question or comment for Mr. Mora. I know it's always kind of tough to be that first, first hand that goes up. There we go, this gentleman in the second row has a question. Actually, yeah. it's this. Yeah. Oh, this spell. Well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right over here. What is your experience like as far as relating when you go to Japan being a third generation Japanese American? It was, when I first got there, it was um, amazing because everybody looked like me. And it, which is a dumb thing to say, right? But 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 um, I suddenly went. I felt differently in my body, and I realized I couldn't understand my feelings as an American because I didn't have anything to contrast. I'd, I'd never been in a place where everybody looked like me. Um, and then I also realized that I, I couldn't understand who my parents were until I knew a little more about Japanese culture. Because they always presented to me as themselves as thoroughly Americanized, and they, um, and then I realized they were raised by Japanese, and so I suddenly had a a, a, a greater sense of who they were. And it was interesting because I'd always thought they'd forgotten all their Japanese, and my father had listened to tapes a little bit before he came to visit. And I'd only taken like a year and a half college Japanese, which was hardly enough. Um, and when he came on Sunday, his Japanese were, was worse than mine. And by about Friday, it was better. But it was interesting, because it was a little boy's Japanese. And Japanese is honorific, and it, it deals with things by sexual roles and ages. So he was speaking like a little boy to people, and it was just strange. And my mother actually couldn't speak, she could just hear. And she was the youngest of five, and I think she was raised actually by her older sisters. And my mother said, how did I ever talk to my mother? <laughs> Bec beca because the, the men often learned English because they had to do business, but m many of the women didn't learn any English. So I, I, it, but she was just taken around by her sisters, so that's partly why. And so. It, one other revelation, my, my father always said that his transition from the internment camps to American society was just easy, nothing. And I, I, I visited uh, Hiroshima, and I began thinking about where my father was when the war ended, after VJ Day. And, and I wrote this passage, which is in Turning Japanese, where I imagined him at VJ Day, and he was going to school in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I realized he couldn't have participated in the VJ celebrations. He couldn't have gone down, down to the town and watched it. And so I knew he was lying. I mean, not in, I don't know, intentionally or not, but he, his idea that, that his entrance to American society was really easy, he was not telling the truth. Neither he repressed that memory or he just chose not to talk to me about it. And I don't think I would have made that realization had I not gone to Japan. And then the whole thing just, you know, 
I changed from somebody who was like reluctant to, to deal with Japan. And I sort of exaggerated a little bit because you're, even in memoir, you're, you're certain fictionalizing a little bit here and there. Um, but by the end, I, you know, I, I knew a lot more about Japanese culture and um, just was a lot more comfortable with that part of my background. Yeah. I was wondering, do you do stage? Uh, what? Yeah, I, 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 I do uh, some acting uh, oh, okay. occasion um, in Minnesota. Um, and we actually have, people don't realize it, because the, the image of Minnesota is like Land of Wa Lake Wobegon, yeah. right? It's like all white Lutheran, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But actually, s over 70% of the kids in both the Minneapolis and St. Paul school system are kids of color. And we actually have the second largest Asian American theater company in the Twin Cities. And people don't realize that. We, we also, people now realize we have a large Somali population. We also have a large Hmong population. Um, do you do current theater or do you do traditional Japanese or? No, no, I do current theater. I, 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 for instance, I, a couple years ago, I, um, I, I was in this play where I played a Cambodian American school teacher who helps one of his kids whose mother's dying of cancer. Um, a few years ago, I actually did play the king in The King and I, um, which was a hoot. I mean, it was just like every night I, in the middle of it when we're doing a Shelby dance, I thought, I'm no Broadway music, you know. I'm, I'm waltzing with Anna, you know. I mean, Deborah Carr. Deborah Carr, yeah. Yeah. One last question. I found it really interesting that you said when you started um, trying to understand your own self validation that you started reading mm. black and African American writers. Because when I started, when I was writing, and I was writing about being an immigrant, and I was trying to understand my own self alienation as a, as a as, you know, Cuban American, I started reading Asian <laughs> American mm -hmm. writers, uh, primarily Chinese immigrant narratives, or, and that's where I found the most, um, in addition to other Hispanic or Latinos. Or that's where I found the most like self-understanding like, of why I was rejecting so many things that I was trying to get at in the writing. Yeah, well, I, I, I think all, you know, because, you know, I do obviously read Latino and Native American writers, and all of them begin to educate me on, on these issues. And, and the other thing is I'm constantly coming up, uh, you know, Nigeria, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Philippines. Dominican Republic, Colombia, Trinidad. I mean, and, and so I have to constantly keep educating myself. Yeah. When um, what you said sparked so many thoughts that it's hard to, to even <laughs> comment on just one of them. But what struck me as I was sitting there listening to you speak um, was that, particularly when you talked about your parents leaving the camps, and not really thinking that it was anything so momentous mm -hmm. in, a, in a real sense. And that made me realize how far we haven't come, really. Yeah. I mean, tonight, the president is speaking yeah. on immigration right now, I think, yeah. just a few miles away. Yeah. And even at the Academy Awards, making a joke about a green, green card, card yeah. you know, uh, to a Mexican yeah. winner of, a, of an Academy Award, when there were the, this whole stream of, of British actors coming up, and nobody said one thing about that. But the, but the whole notion of other is what I then focus mm -hmm. on. And what you're talking about, the alienation that you're talking mm -hmm. about, in terms of so many different groups happening in this country, is because we have so many <coughs> different groups in this country. Uh, and also, if you do look around the world at all these different groups that you're talking about, I can't think of one society which is heterogeneous that doesn't have that sense of other, that someone doesn't have that sense of being, being someone yeah. else. And there isn't that sense of oppression that goes on. And maybe that's one reason why your parents, when they left the camps, it didn't seem so unusual because all around them, they were hearing stories of segregation, of you know, the Holocaust, of this, that, and the other that we live in a pretty brutal world, 
is, I guess, what I'm saying. Well, I, I, all, of this, I, yeah. all of this brings that up. I, I think everything you said is true, and I, but I think one thing is they didn't have a language to talk about it. Right. In other words, I found a language to begin to talk about race from reading black authors. Beca because, because the white authors never talked about race. Because white identity is considered raceless, which it's, it's not. I mean, it, there is a white identity and there, there are rules for being white. And when you break the rules for being white, people tell you. Um, so so I, I don't think they had, had a language to talk about. They didn't know how to talk about their difference. They, they just didn't. And I, I think one of the great things about this time period is we have writers you know, and scholars from all these different communities who are writing about all these different communities and giving us a language to talk about America and, and race in America and who we are in a way that honors our complexity and that really s and tells the stories of all these different communities and, sa and really says, we should all be able to sit at the table and be valued for who we are and honored for who we are. But in order to do that, we have to learn about who we are. And we have to learn about other communities. We can't just know about our own community. We, 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 we can't, uh, or we can't just know about our own community and the white community. We have to know about all these communities. And uh, I think our language is more, the culture as a whole hasn't get caught up to it. But our language is more and more sophisticated and able for people to actually talk about their lives in ways that make sense to them and really reflects their experiences and allows them to own their experiences and say, this is valuable. My experience is valuable. Who I am is valuable. Who my parents are are valuable. Who my grandparents were are valuable. Our portion of American history is essential to American history, to American culture. Professor Gallang has a comment. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. I think the work you're doing is amazing, and I know that you are one of the bona faculty voices of our nation yeah. arts foundation. Yeah. And some of the things we're talking about tonight are things that Bona works with, and that you also yeah. work with as a, a residency master. Could you talk a little bit about that and tell us when you'll okay. be here for Bona? Okay. Yes. So Bona is going to happen in the, in the last two weeks in June here in Miami. We have previously been at uh, uh, in in the Bay Area. And VONA is a writer's conference for writers of color taught by writers of color. And it, it's the only one which, a writers, such writer's conference, which is not restricted to one group. It's to all the different groups. And we've been uh, 14 years, 15 now. And, and so um, for anybody interested in the, in the conference, it's going to be, it, just look V-O-N-A on the internet. You will find all sorts of information about how to apply to the conference and, 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 and to be part of it, and also the events that will be here. And we'll, there'll be a couple faculty readings and a, a students' readings um, here in Miami. So it, it, it's a great chance. And we have just amazing, Evelina Galang uh, here, who's part of the University of Miami Creative Writing Department, head of the Creative Writing Department, um, the, Stacy Ann Chin, Juno Diaz, uh, Elma Zabinator, just a whole range of, 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 of wonderful writers will be here in Miami. Thank you very Thank much. You. Folks, if there are no more questions, and we have Turning Japanese and Where the Body Meets Memory, as well as four more of David's titles, for sale at the counter over there. He'll be signing uh, at the table to the right of the podium. We have this year's big read title, Where, When the Emperor Was Divine. Those are free as part of the big read uh, there in the back row. So I want to thank our good friends at the Center for Writing and Literature at MDC. And this has been such a fascinating presentation. Please give another hand to Mr. David Murrah. Thanks very much. Thank you, David.